Well, thank you, Kathy, and uh, thanks for the folks that are here and those online. Um, tonight is called Climate Impact on Southeast Fisheries. I'm going to be talking about a few different things, like climate change, a little bit. Uh, but I'm going to try to blend all that so that it, it reflects on the fisheries and how the impacts of the fisheries have occurred. And uh, the kinds of things I'm going to cover are uh, uh, changes in the tem temperature and chemistry of the ocean that we're seeing, uh, changes to what we see going on with salmon, because there are quite a few, and they may have an impact on our harvest, uh, commercial harvest in the future, which I'll talk about a little bit. Uh, changes to a little bit in the food webs and uh, using some northern fisheries as an example, because we've got a lot of evidence from the northern area on uh, what's going on and they have a bigger impact up there and also we're seeing some invasive species uh, people are claiming that it's due to climate change I'm not certain of that myself but we'll, we'll I'll talk about that and uh, possible future impacts which is where I'll talk about what the impacts to uh, what fishing game allow, allows us to fish for and how much they allow us to fish so we'll go over those things. Changes in our oceans, um, <clears throat> it, it has, it, the ocean has a lot of effects on our marine organisms. We really don't know what's driving the changes in our salmon. We don't know those things for sure. You know, it's a very, very complex picture out in the ocean and we're not real positive what's going on. But we've got evidence that suggests that the warming ocean is having major impacts to to our fisheries and I'm going to talk about that um, many organisms are sensitive to water temperature change and I'm not talking about 10 degrees changes I'm talking about one degree Celsius which is very little change in temperature is enough to actually cause animals not to to uh, go through spawning or not it, it doesn't take a lot of temperature change to really impact the oceans and if you get a one degree temperature change in the ocean it's it's a major thing because it's a huge body of water that's changed uh, one degree it takes a lot of energy to change one degree Celsius it takes uh, you know almost uh, just to change the temperature it takes it takes quite a bit uh, changes in populations of various fish groups uh, we're seeing changes in what fisheries are happening up and down the coast and we're also seeing changes in some of the bottom fish as well especially in the Arctic the Arctic is seeing major changes in the Bering Sea for example and that that's due to uh, changes in temperature primarily at least there's a lot of evidence for it and then the migration of organisms uh, to deeper waters and toward the poles that's been happening we're starting to see for example, uh, chum salmon, larger numbers of chum salmon up north. Now, I don't know that the same fish that are coming in here are moving north. It's just that it's more favorable for them to spawn in the river system so they increase their numbers. It's, it's the, I, I think the fidelity, which is how much they want to go back to their home stream, is so great that I don't think a lot more fish are straying up north. I think there's always been a, uh, a number of fish that stray up north anyway. We've seen that even with the uh, hatchery releases. We have coat of wire tags in them and we see those fish in the Bering Sea that came out of Whitman Lake, for example, or Neeps Bay. I used to see them in the tag data when I was recovering tags. So we know they move around a long way. Certain stocks do, other stocks don't. Uh, some of the, some of the uh, uh, stocks stay pretty close to home and stay just really in the local waters, not very far offshore. So that kind of thing happens. But what we are seeing is some of the uh, uh, some of the bottom fish stocks are changing dramatically, and I'll show you some data from from uh, up north that will describe some of the changes we've seen. Uh, so what's causing the climate change itself? There's a lot of people out there running around claiming that it's all it's all due to it. solar activity, uh, variable energy from the sun over time. It's always been going on, and the sunspots are cooler, so there's uh, episodic dark uh, 
uh, areas on the sun, bright sunspots and all that kind of thing. Yeah, that's been going on, but 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 there's enough evidence now to suggest that it's more than that. We're driving things very rapidly now. The changes are happening very rapidly now. <clears throat> so yeah, if you la if, what's happening is a lack of cor there's a lack of correlation between solar activity and average Earth temperatures. Okay, and total so solar. Uh, the radiance increases with more sunspots. And it goes through a cycle every 11 or 12 years, something in that range. And uh, it goes quite a bit. And what we see here is this graph here shows you what's happening with the temperature change on, on Earth. It is going up quite a bit instead of just fluctuating around something. But in these last years from the Industrial Revolution up to now, we're seeing some major changes in, in our temperature. Uh, up and down the coast, and it's not—it's not due to the sun. Okay, the sun's not changing that much, so we're fairly convinced of that. So we're seeing increases in ocean temperatures. Sea surface temperatures have risen uh, mostly in the last uh, since 1970, and we're also seeing some deep water changes in temperature. Some of that isn't due just strictly to uh, temperature. Um, from the sun getting heat into the ocean, it's, there's some things called upwelling and downwelling occurring, and that has to do with wind direction, because downwelling occurs in the northern hemisphere when you get a south wind coming up to the north and you're against the coast, water is driven down below the surface. There's a 90 degree change in where that water goes and it gets driven down. and uh, and what happens is uh, the surface water gets driven offshore. It has to be replaced because the water wants to be level. So what happens? The surface water that's there goes down. Okay, it goes down and towards the bottom of the ocean. That warms up the overall ocean. So we're seeing those things go on. And of course, that's going to affect our fisheries. So we also have one other problem, and that's the CO2 problem, the carbon dioxide problem in the ocean. So these are the factors affecting the ocean that have an impact on our fisheries. And these are have an impact on our fisheries very directly to organisms which have shells, okay, calcium carbonate. Because when CO2, carbon dioxide, right here, gets put into the water column, it it changes the pH of the water, but what it really does is it, it, it influences any carbonate that's in the water. The ocean has a buffering process in it. They call it buffering, which means it tries to keep it at, a, at about 8.3 uh, pH all the time. And what happens is, is, that, is that is changing uh, the pH quite a bit. And pH is, is the, uh, how acidic or how basic something is. Seven is neutral, okay? That's where everything is pretty neutral. Anything that's below seven is an acid. Anything above uh, seven is a base, what they call a base. And what we're seeing going on, as you can see it right here, the CO2 changes, it goes through cycles. But if you look at the recent, in the past, this is thousands of your years before present. So if you look right in here, this is current time right in here. And this is the temperature change. This is uh, the uh, what's going on with uh, a CO2 concentration. This is parts per million right here. This is 400 and 200. And what we're seeing is the the current uh, pH or or of the carbon dioxide concentration of parts per million is is upwards over 400 now. And it it never it's never been that high. And which means there's a lot of CO2 going into the ocean. In fact, it's getting most of our, our uh, anthropogenic CO2, which is the arthropogenic, the, uh, the, P the CO2 that's derived from man-made uh, processes, be it burning fuel or whatever, or cows or whatever. <laughs> whatever. It doesn't matter where the CO2 comes from. It comes from a lot of different places. And... Uh, the ocean has taken up one-third to one-half of all the anthropogenic CO2 emissions. 
Um, since the, the ocean mixes slowly, it is concentrated in the upper 10% of the water. So you can see the, the, the description here of, of CO2 up in the water column. It's usually at the surface. But with downwelling, we put CO2 down below the surface. The fact is, there's a lot of CO2 anyway down deep for a very simple reason. There's no life down there. And CO2 is the, what, what really helps to control the CO2 in the upper waters is the fact that photosynthesis is occurring by plankton, things like that, which is a real serious uh, amount of plankton. In fact, a lot of the oxygen we breathe comes from the plankton in the ocean. So, so that's doing a lot of the work right there. The oxygen that comes from uh, photosynthesis comes from the CO2. It breaks that CO2 apart. Okay, and the seeds go into making sugar and food for organisms to eat. So what ends up happening is we end up getting a definite uh, increase in the CO2 right now that, that's fairly significant. If we look at this graph, this is Arctic warming. Uh, this is uh, Arctic warming nearly three degrees Celsius since the mid-1960s. You can see the global changes here. The Arctic is going faster than the rest of the world. As you can see, this red curve here is the Arctic. And it's actually being affected more than, than our uh, local, you know, uh, typical ocean CO2. So we know the Arctic is being impacted very greatly by, by this effect. And the difference in average temperature is only a couple degrees, as you can see here. But it's still, that's a lot. Remember, that temperature is, is a huge influence on, on our salmon, on our uh, bottom fish, whether or not cod want to be in an area, whether uh, those kind of things. And that, that is having a big influence on it. At least we've got good evidence for that. So we're seeing a lot of things going on. Uh, this is a, another anomaly we see with climate change, and that is the hotspot. You probably all heard of that extra warm water that was off the coast in, the, in 2015 and 2016 and 2017 out there. That A lot of people suggested, a lot of scientists were saying that this is causing serious problems with our, our salmon returns. And we're not positive that this was the fact because there's, as you, you're going to see here, there's a whole lot of other things going on with climate change that are influencing this. Anybody tells you they know what's going on with this, we don't. We do not know what's really happening with a lot of this. We just know that, that warming of the ocean is having a tremendous influence on our fish. We know that. We got great evidence for that and statistics for that. Um, this is another uh, climate change, a temperature change relative to the 1850s through 1900. And it's pre-industrial is all here, right here, where the temperature was. And then this is the changes in temperature. And you can see here, it's, it's going up very quickly. In fact, it's going up much faster now that we've gotten to beyond 2020. This is uh, from the National Academy of Sciences. And uh, we see this stuff going up very quickly. And this is where we still have a lot of uh, industrial stuff starting to happen in this area. And so we end up seeing this increase coming from that. And this is pretty hard to refute, this kind of evidence. Uh, we also have ice core data, which we can get. Uh, ice core data is when they actually cut a core out of the ice columns up in glaciers and places like that. We can also determine what the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere was when when the ice got formed. And so we see this curve here, CO2 concentration in parts per million. You can see how it was it was climbing a little bit. This is thousands of years ago. It, it, was, it wasn't terribly changing, but look at what's happened in the recent. This is currently. It just went right up, and we know that. Uh, water temperature influences behavior. What happens is with this temperature change, it influences the the behavior and mortality of marine organisms. Lot, lots of them are influenced by the by the uh, temperature. We know that changes in water temperature can affect these things, and we'll see some of the data from this. Predator prey relationships. 
In other words, what predators are out there and, and what prey are available. Uh, ecological niches, which is nothing more than environment that st had a stable environment with stable organism levels and things like that are niches. And then the resource allocations, uh, this is, uh, if you talk about fisheries, you're talking about the allocations for people to harvest them and those kind of stuff. And species distribution, we're definitely seeing species distribution changes because of what we think is temperature and, and, uh, and ocean acidification changes. Timing of reproduction rate of development, this is really going to be something we're going to have to worry about in the future. Uh, I'll show you some graphs of some of our local systems that I got from ADF and G about, about how the salmon are being affected by that. These alterations can be detrimental to survival of the populations and species. Okay, ocean acidification. This is the t data series that everybody uses right now. And it's, it's, a, it's really data that's being developed by the longest actual physical measuring the data is at the Mauna Loa Atmospheric uh, Lab over in Hawaii. <clears throat> and what you can see here, this is, uh, this is our, uh, our seawater parcel pressure of carbon dioxide, uh, micro atmospheres, and then this is our pH going down, which means it's getting more acidic. It's not acid, but it's getting more acidic. You can see it going down. And then this here is a curve of, uh, of the uh, actual atmosphere above. So this is saying these things are driven by this atmosphere increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. And we're seeing the pH dropping below. In fact, it's down below 8 in some places right now. So it's actually dropping quite a bit here. Um, this is uh, the atmosphere CO2 at Mauna Loa, Loa Observatory, and it's run by the Scripps Institute of Oceanography and NOAA Global uh, Monitoring Laboratory. And this is actual data showing what's going on here. And it's, it's actually this climbing curve is, is showing us that we're actually getting some increases in temperature and increases in, in atmospheric CO2. We know that's happening, and you've probably all heard that. In fact, uh, it says uh, time history of atmosphere mixing ratio of Mauna Loa, Hawaii. The longest available, this is the longest available true data because everybody's going to counter. Uh, how do you know there's any more CO2 in the atmosphere and that kind of stuff? They're going to say your measurements are just, they're not, you haven't been watching it long enough. Well, they've been watching it since before 1960 there. <clears throat> and if you look at this, the longest it's the longest available instrument record seasonally adjusted atmosphere CO2 mixing ratio in in mid 2021 uh, 20, was 415 parts per million compared to pre-industrial mixing ratio was only 280 so before we we had the pre-industrial it was down around 280 and now we're up over almost twice that at 415 at least in 1921. So you can see that it's going up quite a, quite, a, quite a rapidly. So the evidence is there. We know that there's, there's climate change going on and that man has done it. It isn't just sunspots doing this, especially with the CO2. Okay, so let's talk a minute about fisheries. Uh, how does it affect that? How does CO2 affect those? Well, if you look at They've done these studies. This is a research study that they did. Uh, University of Alaska was part of it, and there's several other people that were part of it. And they went out in the ocean and they collected samples. They collected uh, uh, last central uh, Alaskan pink salmon, in other words, those that are out of the central area here, pink salmon. They collected Japanese chum, uh, all those kind of things. And but they, this is the salmon diet. If you look here, a major portion of the 45% of what they encountered in the stomachs of the salmon that they captured out at sea here, out in the open gulf, were made up of pteropods. This is a, this is a small crust, uh, crustacean. It's uh, related to clams and 
oysters and everything else. You know, it's a small thing. It does not have a shell when it's in the open ocean. It only has a shell when it's first starting to form. So when it spawns, it has to produce a shell to be protected as a plankton. Now, if you look at what these things look like, this is a, a, a uh, one right here. These are both pteropods. They're also called generically by people as sea butterflies, and that's obvious why they call it a butterfly. It actually flies like a, a butterfly through the water column. So it's kind of a cool animal. And they're real pretty, and I've seen them in the tide pools here in Ketchikan, by the way. But this is a major, 45% of the pink salmon diet attributed to, to these, uh, and they're only about three quarters of an inch in, in length. Okay, they're not very big. And, uh, but they're full of fat and full of uh, the nutrients that, they, that the fish needs. And so they're very dependent on this. Well, it turns out that in order for these to breed out in the ocean, they have to be able to get carb, uh, calcium carbonate out of the water column. But with CO2 in the water causing uh, carbonic acid, it is driving the carbonic acid available to build shell material, which is what the shell is made of, is calcium carbonate. It's driving that down to the point where it's difficult to get the right kind of calcium carbonate. There's two kinds of calcium carbonate in the ocean that we deal with. One is uh, aragonite, which is the one that they need to build a shell with. The other is calcite, which is the same as limestone or uh, any of those things of marble is calcium carbonate, all that. But the juvenile, the, the larval pteropods need to get aragonite to be successful. Otherwise, they spend all their energy just trying to pull calcium carbonate out of the water and not growing. And so they have to have this aragonite. Well, aragonite happens to be the easy, easiest one to get out of the water. It's also the easiest one for CO2 and carbonic acid to influence. So we end up seeing aragonite shortages all through the oceans, okay? And that's a problem because it's, it's causing these to drop down in numbers dramatically. So we know that's happening. So if we have pteropods, this is one of the sea butterflies going in there. We also have what's called a coccolithophore, which is a little tiny calcium carbonate. It's really tiny. But they are food for what we call copepods. And copepods you're going to find, I'm going to talk about those with, with Chinook salmon and things, is very, very significant. As Because our salmon, when they go to sea, they're, they're only maybe, you know, two or three inches long at the most. And, uh, and uh, they end up feeding primarily on copepods. And that's an important factor for the growth of our salmon in the early life stages. Uh, this is a pteropod here. This is the shell that they develop uh, when they're juvenile. And you can see how nice and, nice and uh, formed it was. But as the pH goes up, exposing to acidic seawater, we end up seeing it eroded away, and it causes the animals to die. So this is not a good thing. It's, 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 it influences the number of pteropods that are going to be available for our juvenile fish when they first go to sea where they need the most nutrients and the most growth. Most growth. Okay. So salmon impacts. So I put this in there just to show you. I'm not going to get through all this. It's just it's very, very complex, all the different things that are affecting what's going on. But you can see there's a whole lot of, of uh, nutrients. There's carbon dioxide, a lot of carbon dioxide chemistry that's influencing the fish. And we see small plankton and different kinds of plankton. And, and a lot of this settles down. And, and this affects our bottom fish and things like that in the benthic area. Uh, but it's, it's not a simple thing. We can't point our finger on what's causing our lower numbers of salmon coming back or any of that. We can't point a finger. I mean, there's people that are going to tell you they know what it is, but we don't. Okay? It's, it's just it's a very complex system. So the things that we know are in, that are influenced by temperature 
and also temperature even in the streams is a thing called fecundity. That's how many eggs a female has when they go back and to spawn in the river system. Fecundity is how many eggs that goes into the female. Predator def uh, predation defense, depth of de deposition in the river systems, for example. Placement of reds. Reds are, are nothing more than the, uh, the nests that they dig. They go in and they shake their tail and they dig some sediment up and then they put eggs in there and then uh, a, a male will come along and fertilize the eggs and then they bury the eggs in there and supposedly they, they, they uh, develop into little, little fry and juveniles. Uh, ocean prey quality, that's important because if they're not getting the pteropods or the plankton that they need, it's going to affect our fish. We also know the shifts in age and maturity. This is something that is really significant, and we're seeing this. I'm going to show you some graphs here in a second that describe that very thing, and that's really significant. We're starting to see now, we're starting to see more females in the, what's called the two ocean component. That's a, a basically a, a four-year-old fish, okay, what we call four-year-old fish. These are the ones that come back that are usually all males. They're not anymore. There's more females in there. They used to be almost 80, 90 percent uh, males to ocean fish. Now it's upwards, it's getting up there. You know, it's getting up above 30 and 40 percent. So we're starting to see that happening, which means that we're seeing a transfer of fish that because of their growth patterns at sea, we think it's caused by something at sea, that those animals are actually uh, ending up getting influenced as to when they're going to come back as a female or a male. Okay, the, the females are going to come back earlier is what's going on. And so we see, see more two ocean fish in the, in the process. Another thing that we're seeing, that there, I saw a great paper on this. Uh, not too long ago, on copepods. These are copepods, and of course our juvenile uh, smaller salmon, like, like some of the sockeye, some of the uh, uh, chum salmon to some degree, and especially pink salmon, when they're juveniles, really small, before they're starting to eat pteropods, they feed on copepods. And, and chinook do too, some of the smaller chinook that are going out. What we're finding is there's, there's two, a couple of species. It turns out there's cold water species of copepods, copepods which are indicated on this graph in blue, and the, and the red are summer or, or warm water copepods. These have far less nutrition. In fact, it says northern copepods, fewer copepod species. These organisms are high in fat content and appear to be essential for many fishes to grow and survive during the winter. The southern copepod species are generally smaller with low fat reserves and less nutritional value. Poor feeding conditions for small fish are that are prey for juvenile salmon during the, the recent uh, change in temperature. So this is, this is just saying that these copepods are changing in our northern area, especially just below in the Gulf, in the northern Gulf of Alaska just below the, the, the Barren Up and certainly the ones in the, in the Bering Sea and places like that. But our fish go into these ones in the Gulf and they're being influenced by the fact that our copepod species are actually changing to some degree. And we're seeing more southern types of copepods in the open ocean. And they've done studies on this and collected samples in some uh, oceanographic surveys recently and they're definitely seeing this to be the case. We're not seeing as many of the real nutritious, larger coke pods that are full of fat that the, that the juvenile fish need to eat. So what are we seeing actually in our lengths of our fish? If we look at this, this is, uh, this is the, just some graphs that, that, that people have put together, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has put these together and they used a lot of points, uh, over 7 million data points, where they checked the fish that were collected in fisheries and escapements and catch, those kind of things. 
And what they did is they checked the size of the fish. And we've got Chinook salmon here averaging, uh, you know, upwards of uh, 770. Uh, this is a 28 inch fish, kind of pretty close right in here. And then uh, we can see that they're, they're driving the numbers down in millimeters. These are in millimeters, by the way. And we can see chum salmon fluctuating, but they're also on the decline. So are coho, and so are sockeye. All the species are going down in length. In other words, the average length at a certain age is going down. We know that's happening. Then we can look at Chinook salmon, and this is some data that I got from Ed Jones. I called him up at ADF&G, and I knew he had, had worked this out. And this is uh, Oregon and BC. We can see here, uh, this is the length and the proportion of them that were three and four year olds. And this is three and four year olds. The blue is, uh, is the four ocean fish. And the, the uh, ah, yeah, that, where did it go? There it is there. Oh. You want to hit the slideshow again? From that current slide, just hit from current current slide. This this uh, this data here. This data here is data that is showing that the both the length and the age, the number of age four year olds are, is dropping. Now this is serious, uh, and I thought, well, yeah, but what is this? And these are these are fish that are caught in our fishery. Uh, that's why this SEAC troll, that's Southeast Alaska troll fishery, that that were measured, and the age and they were aged using otoliths and and uh, coat of wire tags, and we can see here that as you go up through 20, this is through 2021 20, here, uh, we can see that the the curve was going up on this red, the red, three oceans going up. In other words, a higher proportion of them are becoming three-year-olds. Four-year-olds are going down. We see that here. But we also see that these all look like they're both going down over there. We don't see that up here. But this is in Salmon River in Oregon. This is in Robertson Creek in BC, which a lot of our catch has been Robertson Creek fish. If we look at the Nushkiak and uh, the Yukon River, we also see the same kind of trends. Uh, not as much size. It seems to be pretty stable. But the age proportion is definitely changing. We're seeing, again, uh, more three-year-olds climbing. That's climbing and more, less four-year-olds. And we really want to see the four ocean fish. Four ocean, not, not four year, four age. Four ocean, which means it's in Alaska, those fish would be, uh, um, well, I'm not sure if these are, these are uh, two ocean fish before they go to sea or not. The ones up here in the Yukon probably aren't. They're probably the same as the Oregon. And, uh, so the, the, so these, are, these are four ocean, which would be the, the ones that are primarily female. Okay, So that's, we're seeing those numbers go down. So let's look here at, as we move south, Copper River looks pretty much the same, but the Kenai River uh, actually showed a trend similar to Oregon there, where the age proportion is dropping, uh, and the three three years uh, three o three ocean fish are coming up. These are still going to be a lot of females. Well, let's look at Southeast Alaska, and that's so we're worried about that more here in Southeast. Um, but these are all the same fit trends we're seeing up and down the whole coast. Age, size at age, pretty much stable, and chill cats pretty much stable, but these curves are not. The age proportions are also climbing, three ocean fish are climbing, and eventually we get to the Unic River and the Chickaman River, or in the Stikine River. The Unic is a good example of for here because it's right in back of Ketchikan here and on the Bean Canal. Uh, what we end up seeing is, again, sizes, declining uh, at, at, at a specific age to some degree. And we also see a very different proportion of three ocean and four ocean fish. Now, 
you might not think that this is a big deal, but it, it actually is a big deal because if you think about about the size of the fish, the the three ocean fish have less eggs. The fecundity is down in those. So when Fish and Game decided on escapement goals for these systems, they were looking at at size of fish and the percentages when they were up much much uh, higher. Uh, there were there were much higher uh, percentages of, of fish. Proportion of the fish that had a lot of eggs was higher. Now the egg numbers are getting lower, and there's less. In fact, uh, I think this year they said they hardly saw any of the females in the, in the fishery. So we end up having escapement goals that are no longer really. They're going to have to recalculate the escapement goals. And what that means is they're going to say we've got to slash our fisheries more because we need to get more fish back into the river. There's also another thing going on and that is the nutrient levels. There's, I just read a paper yesterday uh, that suggests that, that the number of fish that spawn in the river system have a lot to do with the health of the juvenile fish that come out of the, the spawning out of that stream. In other words, the carcasses provide nutrients during the winter that are needed by the, the uh, and they assimilate this through their skin or whatever, uh, as well as, as food items. They assimilate some of these nutrients. So that ends up being a significant piece of what's going on uh, as well. So there's a lot of points that, that we're, not, we're not really well aware of yet, what's causing this stuff. But it actually, the nutrient levels, if we get less fish back into the streams, we end up reducing those uh, nutrient levels. So over escapement might have been a positive thing in the past, and we, which we've always said is it, it hasn't been because we've looked at the returns related to over escapement, and that's, that certainly drops. It's, you don't want to get over escapement, but it also means that you might have to have a lot of fish in the stream in order to provide the nutrient levels that you need. So other fisheries up in the north. This is uh, I got this from uh, from Gay um, um, oh, I can't remember her guy's name right now. Gay up in uh, Nome. She's the uh, marine advisory agent up in Nome, and she has put together this kind of information. They've had fisheries changes in their things from Arctic cod. To Pollock because of the change, they they're seeing uh, this. There was a real dependence on fish, smaller fish, for some of these species at the surface that were feeding on this uh, these uh, fish because they can't eat a real big big fish or anything like that. Where uh, in 2010, this is what the fishery looked like: Pollock and and Pacific cod and and Tom cod and Arctic cod were were both down uh, and what we're seeing now is those have dropped way off. We're seeing huge numbers of pollock and Pacific cod now in comparison to what it was before. Some of that has to do with the fact that they're used to eating some uh, larger fish and things that is going, going bad now. It's changed dramatically from the past. We think that climate change, at least they believe it's Bering Sea benthic temperatures have gotten colder, creating more, more fish that are bigger in, down there because there's more food items and uh, it's causing some problems with their fishery. Uh, we also are seeing changes in the red king crab opening. They had one this year. They got it, at least our, they've got it scheduled, uh, uh, king crab opening, but the fishermen have all got together and said, we're not going to fish it because we're worried about the the fishery because we're not seeing the kind of king crab we used to have. So in 2019 they did not have a king crab fishery at all. And some of this is because there isn't enough food. 2020 the salmon fishery was uh, uh, 292,000 fish up north. This uh, Before it used to average somewhere in the order of two million dollar fishery. And now it's down at 292 million or $292,000. So it's, it's getting to be serious. 
some of the other issues that we're seeing with climate change that I'm not positive that this is the case, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. We've got European green crab that we've been watching, and I've been sampling for these. And the only places they've been sampled are, there's one sample right here um, on Haida Gwaii, catch cans right here. And, uh, and so this is getting pretty close. And then we've got the, all these samples here. They call it green, European green crab. The outer coast of, of Vancouver Island is tremendously impacted by them. And what we're more worried about than anything is there is a very strict temperature regime in which they can spawn and they won't spawn. We're not positive that they would do real well up here because, because the temperature isn't, isn't quite warm enough yet. But it's changing. We're, you saw that graph we showed earlier. It's good three degrees or something. And so it's, it's uh, average temperature is changing. So what we're looking at are, are several invasive species we're worried about. The Demium, which is Dvex, which over in Sitka, they had that outbreak. Uh, this is a couple samples I took of, of Botryoides here, which is a tunicate. It's a colonial tunicate, which can bury and kill clams and stuff. And this is another one called Botrylis. Uh, so they're closely related. This is a, a, I can't see it very well, but there's a bunch of it on the side of this oyster from a farm over in Metlakatla that I took a while back. We also, this is the European green crab. This is a uh, Pictopodia sea star, and uh, you probably have a hard time finding one of these now. They really got hit real hard. Uh, whether or not this had anything to do with climate change, I can't tell you that it has. Um, the, I know that, the, that on the East Coast, this kind of wasting disease has occurred on a regular basis in an interval of 10 or 12 years every now and again. So I don't know that that had anything to do with it. The other one is this right here, which is a blue mud shrimp, which at Herring Cove and places like that, there are blue mud shrimp. And uh, I'll show you a couple things, and I'm sampling for this now. Well, these are not an invasive species, but this is. This is a, uh, a uh, um, small parasite that gets into the shell and actually sterilizes the animal. And I'll show you some data here real quick. This is what it looks like. Um, this, is, this is one that was... Um, um, this is typical of what it is. This is the uh, parasite. gets underneath the shell and causes a bulge on it. And John Chapman, who I'm working with, he's out of uh, the University of Oregon, or Oregon State University, and also somebody from Colorado. And we're looking for, for this. He found a lot of these in Ketchikan. And in fact, this is a uh, flyer. The blood mood shrimp, uh, mud shrimp, catching is affected with the invasive isopod. It's an isopod type parasite. Um, Ortheona. Notice that the shell is bulged out and deformed on one side of the body due to the speed uh, isopod growing underneath. It doesn't kill the animal, but it sterilizes the animal so they can't reproduce. And this Barb Morgan took this picture on one of her walks with her students out here. Uh, she had a class and took them out to the beach, and they turned over a rock, and sure enough, they found this. It was 217, 2017 in Refuge Cove. And uh, the university, or the uh, John Chapman from Oregon, was really excited about this picture, by the way. I sent it to him. And they were real excited because it ended up being um, changing his view of. He thought that. that Everything happened around the warm, that warm hot spot that I showed you a picture of earlier, and that that may have allowed this isopod to, to move around from, from places, uh, from Asia, I believe he thinks it's from. And uh, I'm not certain of this because, because, to be honest with you, I've looked for these things, and I've, I've never seen one, ever, in all the walking I've done on beaches. So, I'm not certain that it's, it has anything to do with the temperature because we haven't been looking. Nobody's been looking at these things. These things vary. I mean, they're hard to find. They weren't hard to find for, the, for those guys. 
this is what they saw in Ketchikan here. It, in fact, in, in Oregon, they said if, if 60% of the animals are, inf are uh, infest infested, there's a collapse in the population. And, and our, our in his surveys here in Ketchikan were 78% uh, were there and 67% uh, were, uh, were in Ketchikan for the, uh, that's the uninfected male uh, had, had this parasite associated with, which means we had real problems. So I'll leave it at that point for questions. Are there any questions?